Psalm 139. I, I, I like this psalm. Let's begin at verse 1 in Psalm 139. O Lord, you've searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down, when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out, my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. You've laid your hand upon me. Come on. Let, let me give you a picture of that. Tim, come, Tim, come here a minute. This is what a guy does. What he, David said, Look, you know all about me. You hem me in. I'm going to get you on the right path, Tim. So I'm here. Now I've hemmed him in. Why? There's, there's barrier on both sides. Okay? And then he starts to wander off, and I take my hand and pull him back. Huh? I didn't grab his ear and pull him back. I, I, I take, take my hand, and what am I do? I'm guiding him. Your hand is on my life. That's what David is talking about. God hemmed me in. God, God made, oh, I couldn't go this far. No, God's put limits on your life. God's put boundaries around you. Praise God. Praise God. Again, some of us would have gone off the deep end if God didn't just absolutely put a wall there. You know, we were running in our own well, and bam, we ran into a wall. God said, you're my son. I'm going to give you a lot of room and a lot of latitude, and you can even walk in rebellion, but you can't walk away from me because I put a wall there. <laughs> you know, And then he puts his hand on us to, to, to guide us. You hem me in, verse 5, you hem me in behind and before, you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Even there. If, if, if I'm in church... <laughs> You're there. If I, if I desert you and walk down the streets and hang around with my own buddies, your hand will show up there. Your Holy Spirit will convict me and work on me and mess with me. By the way, that's what you pray over your children if they walk away. Holy Spirit, mess with them. <laughs> Holy God, get in their life. Pim them in. They want to go someplace to have fun. They can't have fun anymore. You know, you put a hem around their fun. Glory to God. So I looked up the word guide in, in the dictionary and I found some interesting things. As a verb, to guide means to, a, to assist a person to travel through or reach a destination in an unfamiliar area by accompanying them or giving them directions. Wow. So if, if you need a guide, you need someone who as you're traveling in order to reach your destination... You're going into an area you're unfamiliar with. They're either going to accompany you or they're going to give you directions. When we go to Israel next week, we will have a guide. Hmm? And, and that's because the guide knows where we are in Israel. <laughs> Amen? Now, that doesn't mean when we get to a spot, we get to Shiloh. We know a lot about Shiloh. We can talk about Shiloh. We may even know some, some more details about Shiloh than maybe the guide knows. That's quite possible. But we don't know the area around Shiloh. We wouldn't know which road to take. I wouldn't take you all over there and say, well, let's get in the car and just drive around the West Bank. <laughs> oh, no. I am not going to get in that car and just drive around the West Bank and say, well, I think this is a road we can take and find out I've just driven into Nablus <laughs> where they're known to shoot at foreigners who come into their city. You know, I want to guide because I'm not familiar, come on, with the, the, the area. So to assist someone to travel through or reach a destination in an unfamiliar area. That means to guide them. Secondly, to guide means to force a person, object, or animal to move in a certain path. Now that's a different sense of guide. A guide is somebody who forces you to, to move in a certain way. We were down in, in, in Haiti one time and as we're uh, driving down with Scott, it was just Scott and, uh, and Donna and I, and uh, I think Taryn was in the car, and Jordan. And this was years and years ago. And as we're driving up, there was some kind of commotion going on, and all of a sudden, I heard a gunshot. And the minute Scott heard the gunshot, his arm went out and, and, and grabbed Jordan and just pushed her down behind the dashboard. And just automatic. That, he, he guided her to safety. Huh? <laughs> 
My mother had a habit, this was before seat belts, so some of you can't even imagine a world before seat belts. But she'd drive along and put her brakes on her arm would go out. I mean, just automatically. Brakes, boom. I mean, brakes, boom, you know? And even when we had seat belts, I mean, years later, brakes, boom, her hand go out, just like that. Why? Because my little body was ready to go forward, okay? What was she doing? She was guiding me to say, forcing me into a position where I'd, I'd be in, in safety. Sometimes God's going to be guiding you that way. He puts pressure on you. Sometimes people find that when they come for counsel for Donna and I. Man, we're putting pressure on you. Man, we're pushing this. We're pushing this. Sometimes you get, why are you pushing me? You know, but you know, we're pushing you to safety. It's, it, to guide is at times to force an animal or an object or a person uh, to move in a certain path. I'm going to get you in the path. Once you're in the path, you'll be okay. I got all that confidence, but I got to get you in the path. Okay? And then thirdly, to guide means to supply a person with advice or counsel as in practical or spiritual matters. This is a secular dictionary. So, so to guide is to assist, to lead, to accompany, to give directions, to push. All that's involved for one purpose, to get you in the right place. Now if we look at guide as a noun, somebody who is a God, as a noun, a guide is one who shows the way by leading, directing, or advising. One who shows the way by leading, directing, or advising. Leading, directing, or advising. When they give you advice, that's guidance. When they're directing you to take these steps, that's guidance. Or they might even be leading you. I used to take, uh, when I worked at the Salvation Army camp down in Sharon, I'd have all these children from the inner city. And, uh, w you know, you think of Sharon, Massachusetts is a pretty highly developed place, but where the camp was, there was probably maybe 10 acres of woodlands out there and little swamps going through it and rivers and things like that. And so we'd, at some point in the 10-day camping experience, we would take all our 30 children for an overnight and we'd walk out into the woods and there was a campground out there where we'd pitch little tents and be there. And I learned after my first time there, my first week of kids, I realized I've got these children from the inner city. They're more street savvy than I am. I mean, they, I had the youngest group. I did not want to deal with teenagers. So I said, I'm taking the youngest group. So I had seven-year-old and eight-year-olds. And I, and I know some of them lied. They had to be six. <laughs> you know, and I got these inner city streetwise kids who, you know, know more about that part of life than I do. You know, they've seen more knives than I can count, you know. And, and, uh, and I realized this is a tough group to deal with. So after the first uh, week of, of learning that, the next week came and I said, I want to be the first one in the woods. In fact, I want to go in the woods the first night. So the first night that it's open. So they show up in the day, we get them there, we them where the bunks are, they spend that night, the very next night I'm taking them out into the woods. And I wanted to do that for a simple reason. I wanted to reduce their dependency entirely to me. <laughs> I wanted them to get that lesson in them real quick. And so I'd take them out there, and we'd go out in the woods, and I'd say, okay, we're very narrow little trail, and there's, and there's limbs and, 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 and roots all over the place. And then I'd say, okay, now we're going to learn how to trust. I said, I'm going to lead you. And the one behind me, you're going to hold on to my belt. Okay? And the one behind them, you're going to hold on to their belt. And I'm in the front, and I had two counselors in the back. I said, now we're going to turn off our flashlights. And now it's pitch black. I mean, pitch black. These city kids had never seen black. They did not, they were black kids who didn't know what black was. I mean, they, they, they you know, and, and as soon as we turned the lights out, ah! I mean, they, they just, you know. I said, no, let's just be quiet. We're going to stand here for a minute until your eyes get used to it. So we'd spend maybe five, ten minutes, and I'd just be talking with them. And gradually, oh, I, I, can, I can see the form of trees you know, from whatever moonlight was there and everything. I said, okay, now we're going to walk. Well, man, I tell you, they bunched together. I mean, they weren't casual about it. None of them, even the toughest guy who was, I can do anything, you know, anywhere else, I don't need anybody, I can do my own. Man, he's holding on to the one in front of him like this, you know. I mean, they are just holding on. Hmm? And, and then I would lead them. Hmm? That's what a guide is, a guide who leads you through challenging or difficult situations. 
The second definition of a guide as a noun is one who serves as a model for others as in a course of conduct. Well, boy, that's a good biblical concept there, isn't it? One who serves as a model. That's what a guide is, one who serves as a model. So I can say that, that uh, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland are guides to Donna and I, not because we know them personally. You know, not because, you know, we pick up the phone and say, Hi, Kenneth, how are you? Hey, Don, how you doing? You know, we don't have that kind of a relationship, but they're a model. We watch them. I don't need conversation with them. And, you, you, you know, I, I don't need to have intimate fellowship with my guide. I mean, it's, uh, I, you know, because in that case, they're a model for me. How they speak, how they talk, how they handle difficult situations, how they handle bad news. See, all these things that, that go on, I watch them. First time I ever saw Brother Copeland, I was, I was in a, a meeting in, a uh, camp meeting in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and, and I'm up in the balcony, and there's all my heroes of faith at the time. There's Brother Copeland and Fred, uh, Fred Price, Dr. Frederick C.K. Price, and, and John Osteen was there, Joel Osteen's dad. I mean, my, my whole pantheon of Word of Faith heroes was there, and while we're there, a man died. Up in one of the balconies, a man had a heart attack and died. What a place to die, you know, in, in the middle of a spiritual meeting. Well, Ananias and Sapphira died going to church, <laughs> you know. But, but a man had a heart attack. We found out later he died, but he had a heart attack. And everybody in the whole place, Brother Hagen was up there preaching at the time and stopped, or I think he was giving announcements and he stopped, because there's a commotion going on up there. And, and the medics run over there. And everybody is looking up at the balcony. Well, most people looking up at the balcony. Me, I'm looking at the front row. I'm watching my heroes. I want to know what do they do. I don't want to be like everybody else. I want, I want, what are they doing? Not one of them looked up there. I noticed they immediately began to pray. I, I know Brother Copeland just began uh, just pacing like this. And I realized what he's doing. He's talking to the Holy Spirit. What do, you, do you want me to do something? And later he talked about that. About a year later he described that meeting and how he said, Abba, do you want me to go up there and, and pray over that man? And the Lord told him no. Why would the Lord say that? Why did Ananias and Sapphira die? Come on. They're in the middle of the, the most miracles ever going on. Right there in church, there's Peter. Everybody. There are things that people sow in their life for which consequences come that God himself cannot stop. They've given the devil legal right. You know? But So he's not just doing what everybody expects. He's checking in with his heavenly guide. What do you want me to do, heavenly guide? So he's a model for me. I, I watch him. I, I, I study that to, to see what's going on. So a guide is one who's a model. And then thirdly, a guide, listen to this. In military terms, a guide is a member of a group marching in formation who sets the pattern of movement or alignment for the rest. He's the guide. So if, if we're marching along and here's a formation and they're, they're 10 this way and 20 deep and because of the maneuvers we're going to do, the commander of that group says, Long, come forward and, and act as guide. Yes, sir. Boom. And I stand right here. Now, here's 10 that way and they're all back that way and I seem to be standing by myself. And what am I doing? I'm setting the pace. But more importantly, we're going to come to a turn, I become the pivot. I become the pivot. So the guy goes, call him right, ho! And I turn and stop. I don't keep marching. Everybody else, this whole column starts swinging around me. I'm the pole, I'm the pivot, I'm the guide. That whole column comes goes around me exactly right. They don't start cutting the corner and everything. So that when they all come around, they're all lined up. If there was not a guide there, you know, this guy might move a little bit this way and this guy, by the time you're back, boy, they're nowhere near that pivot point. They're over here and now the line starts going down that road in a parade formation and they're crooked. You ever seen a car whose wheels are out of a line? It's coming straight at you, but it's kind of like going this way, you know, and you, you look and the front wheels and the back wheels aren't lined up. And you can have military columns in a parade. They're not lined up at all. You know, each one is just a little off. And so they, as they came around the corner, they ended up skewed as they went down. That's why you have a guide. A guide is the one that keeps the formation right. 
My goodness gracious. I'm looking at these definitions and saying, Holy Spirit, it's all over there. So a guide means to lead, implying showing the way or pointing out or determining the course to be taken. A guide implies continuous presence in showing or indicating a course. That's right out of the dictionary. A guide implies continuous presence. Naomi is continuously with me in my car. She might not be saying anything. You know, her little thing might say, you know, I'm looking up there and it says 30 miles to the next, next decision I got to make, next change of direction. And so for 30 miles, we're talking away, we're listening to music or tapes, we're doing whatever, and Naomi's silent. And all of a sudden, you know, half an hour later, it's like she wakes up. Right turn in two miles. <laughs> it's like, oh, hi, Naomi, how are you? She was always with me, tr you know, tracking me wherever I was going, just because I didn't hear from her doesn't mean she didn't know where I was. Come on, didn't know where I was. Come on, God gives you direction, says go do this. Well, you know, he didn't talk to me today. What did he tell you? He told you to do something this week. He's there, but he's waiting for you to do the things he told you this week. You know, we get this, well, can I talk to him now? Well, can I talk to him now? Well, can I talk to him now? Can I? That's not what a guide is. A guide thinks you should have enough sense to say, here you go, go out to that door. Well, what do I do? Go to the door. Well, what do I do? Go to the door. Well, what do I, you know, all, no, no, no. The guide's going to stand there and you go to the door. When you get to the door, when you get to the door, then I'll give you the next direction. Have you ever had directions given to you? Uh, when you need to go somewhere and somebody says, well, let's, listen, you know, you head to Winchington, when you find, get downtown Winchington, turn right, you're going to go down two blocks, take a left, you're going to go up past the library, you go about three more blocks, turn right, that'll be Foster Street, and you're trying to write? And it's like, whoa, 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 I'm, I'm still downtown Winchington. You know, I, I've been in places where I need directions, I'll call people, and, and it's a long list. I'll, say, I'll tell you what, uh, I'm going to go the five miles you told me to go, and I'll call you back when I get there. You know, because I, I don't, I, you know, I, I have my cell phone, but I don't have a means of writing it all down. So I drive to that point and say, okay, now I'm approaching this place you said. Okay, now you do this and do this. In other words, give me the directions as they're about to unfold. Does, does that make sense to you? That, 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 that's how God does. You know, we're, we're trying to get answers from God when we haven't done what he's told us to do. You're not at the door yet. Abraham, go to a land that I will show you. Well, where's the land? Just go. I can imagine Abraham sitting in his tent, just sitting there. Well, God, where is it? I will show it to you. Next day. Well, God, where is it? I will show it to you. God, how come you're not showing it to me? Because you're not going. Come on. Oh, okay, I got everything packed up. It's already, now what do I do? Go west. Where are we going? To a land I'm going to show you. Yeah, but where? God, how come you're not telling me where? Just go west. You're not, you're not going west yet. How can I tell you? You're not going west. Does it make some sense? People are, are confused, they say. I don't know what God wants with my life. It's simply because you haven't done the things he's told you. He'll, he'll detail it out, but he's not going to say, here's a book, and this is your whole life plan. You know why? Here's what you do. <laughs> I wonder who I'm supposed to marry. <laughs> oh, wow, him? Whoa, her? Whoa! And then you go try to make it happen. And you skipped over the chapters that said, here's what you need to do about you. And so you're trying to make that happen, but you skip the chapters that say you need to renew yourself, think differently yourself, get yourself prepared, and you think you're going to come out here, and that's going to happen, but you haven't done the preparation. And then you say, well, I thought God said, well, God may or may not have said, but if he said, guess what? You didn't do your part. Does that make some sense? That's right. And then there's things that, that if you looked ahead, you'd say, I'm not going on the trip. <laughs> had I known, <laughs> had I known, <laughs> God, had I known you were going to ask me to do that. You know, when I became a Christian, I didn't know God was going to ask me to be a pastor. And then he started out by asking me to be a missionary. Would you be a missionary? No. Well, I got no more guidance. 
And then finally, I was just so miserable, I said to God, look, if you want me to be a missionary in China, I will be a missionary in China. Because I'd rather be with you and be miserable than to be miserable without you. So, you know. And then it was shortly after they said, I haven't called you to be a missionary, but I do want you to be a pastor. I said, well, what was missionary all about? Missionary was about obedience. <laughs> you say, I'm your Lord, I'm your God, I'm, your, I'm the leader of your life, and I say, I want you to go do something. You said, no, we've got to deal with that issue right now. Well, what about this promise? There are no promises right now because we've got to deal with that. Johnny misbehaves, and his birthday's coming tomorrow. What am I going to get for my birthday? We're not even talking about birthday right now. We're dealing with your misbehavior right now. And, and if you don't get this misbehavior corrected, you probably won't have many more birthdays. <laughs> get that in your brain. That if we don't deal with this, you don't have any more birthdays. <laughs> oh, that's serious. That's serious. Because if you'll deal with this, come on, then we can have birthdays. Listen, child of God, if you don't deal with this, you're going to die. I can't talk about your future. Because if you don't deal with this sin in your life, this disobedience in your life, you're, you're going you're gonna to step over a line beyond which I can deal with anything, and you're going to die, and now all those promises of the future mean nothing. So the only thing I've got to talk to you is, what are you doing now? You're in disobedience to me, and that's the most dangerous place to be. There is no future when you're in disobedience. Not because God doesn't have a plan but if, if that plan isn't going to come to fruition, if in fact you stay in your disobedience. 